Good morning. Good morning. So this morning, um, I was thinking about what kind of theme we could have and what we could do. Um, and I'm still into Nguyen, Henry Nguyen, as I mentioned, I think the last time, not last month, but the month before, um, as a, being a, he's a, he's a Catholic priest who um, wrote volumes and volumes and volumes on the spiritual life um, and how to live it um, in many different ways, prayer and, and um, the inner journey, and it's very, very powerful. And there's, there's got to be about 50 books on Amazon.ca that have been, some of them are books that he wrote as books, and many of them are also collections of various writings that he did. Um, and Lauren says he was reading new and in seminary, so it's been around for kind of a while, and he died, of, I can't remember quite when he died. Do you remember when he died? No, I, it was, I think it was late 80s, maybe or 90s even. But um, he died quite suddenly um, of a heart attack. Anyway, um, I get one of these daily emails that come that you can sign up for, and it's a quote from, from one, of, one of the writings from this man, Henry Newman. And um, so often, as we've been kind of doing this little process once a month when Lauren goes into Sunday school, I've kind of taken my inspiration from some of the things that I received in my inbox from Mr. Henry, or Reverend, I should suppose, um, Henry Newman. Um, and today is not an exception. So here is one of the quotes that recently came through, and it, and it really kind of struck, struck me and started me thinking. So the quote is this, um, Our hearts and minds desire clarity. We like to have a clear picture of a situation, a clear view of how things fit together, and clear insight into our own and the world's problems. But just as in nature, colors and shapes mingle without clear-cut distinctions, human life doesn't offer the clarity we are looking for. The borders between love and hate, evil and good, beauty and ugliness, heroism and cowardice, care and neglect, guilt and blameness, and lessness, are mostly vague, ambiguous, and hard to discern. It is not easy to live faithfully in a world full of ambiguities. We have to learn to make wise choices without needing to be entirely sure. So as a person with control issues, I know I'm alone in the room, Sally. Um, she didn't even hear me. <laughs> That's okay, I just talked about you um, in reference to control issues. Um, hi, Sammy. That's very sweet. Um, this, is, this is a difficult pill to swallow, but um, more true than I would like. And um, as I get older, I realize just how true, how true it is. Um, there, there are silly examples of, I mean, I say control issue, issues sort of jokingly, but, um, but it's true, it kind of fits in with all of this. Um, I was talking to a teacher at the, at the school a little while ago, um, where I was subbing and she was saying about how, when she started out as a teacher, um, when there would be sort of free play in kindergarten, there are, there are a lot of toys that come out, and you know, it's, it's kind of controlled, but they're, they're, they're all there, all the little pieces are everywhere, and when it would be time to clean up, she would get very anal about, well, the Polly Pockets have to go together, and the Lilla's Pet Shops have to go together, and the Playmobiles have to go together, and they should not be mixing. They should not be mixing. It needed to be clear, it needed to be, you know, clean cut, and all separate. And she says, it's been a few years now where she's really had to let that go. Because if it's gonna flow, and if it's gonna work, there's going to be mixing. Um, so things are not as clear cut. And it made me think of Sally, which is why I mentioned her before, um, and how when she um, first started as a mom with Emma Jane, she told me this story quite in front of several people, so I'm sure it's not a big deal. But um, how, when she, you know, doing crafts with Emma Jane, and how, well, here's the picture of what it's supposed to look like, and here's where the pieces are supposed to go. And then I think it might have even been before Sam, not even post Sam. It was kind of like, yeah, here are the stuff, do what you want with it. And you get to a point where you just sort of say, you know what, there are some things that need to be very specific, and, and, and that's, that's okay. And then there's times where you have to recognize um, that if things are kind of messy, it's okay. And actually, it's better. And actually, it's more a reflection of the way life really is and the way the world really is than trying to keep everything very, very controlled. Um, on a more serious kind of, um, of, of note, I guess, um, I'll tell you another story that happened to me at school. I was at um, a different school this week, not the one that I'm usually at, not as an end, um, but I've been there a fair bit nonetheless. Um, there was a teacher who came to me at lunch. Well, I've been telling some of the teachers there previously that we were going to Disney in a couple of weeks and um, and talking about Disney, um, you know, talking about Lauren and, and you know, how there's going to be challenges getting on the plane and kind of figuring out how all the logistics are going to work. And so they kind of have a sense that they know what the deal is and they know that Lauren has MS and all of that. So this week I was there and um, 
this teacher came up to me and she sat down and I haven't actually really talked to her very much. She 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 kind of keeps to herself a little bit. She doesn't always come into the lunchroom, so I, I hadn't really had too much contact with her. Um, um, I'm not even actually sure what her name is, so I don't have to worry about anonymity because I don't remember her name. But um, she came and sat down. And she said, um, "You know, I don't want to, I don't want to insert myself into your life." But um, and I'm thinking, "Oh my gosh!" She walked by the classroom and I yelled at a child, and she wants to tell me how I, you know, how this is horrible. You know, like I did something, and she's gonna, you know. So she, I don't want to insert myself into your life, but um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this man called Jean de Dieu. I don't know if you've heard of him before. Lauren had heard of him before when he came home with the story. But um, apparently he is this, this guy, sort of a, I guess like a mystic or a spiritual, she's, she comes from a Catholic kind of perspective, so I don't know if he's hooked really in with the Catholic um, church or whether he's kind of on his own. But um, he's in Brazil, and he's located in kind of this, like, cave, apparently, where there are a lot of crystals, vibrations are strong, um, from the earth, and um, he heals people, she says. Um, he, people go to him, and they're sick, and they go to him, and he heals them, and then they're 100% they're, they're well again. And she said he needed to do it from long distance, that there was, um, I don't know if any of you have watched, I, I feel like he's on PBS, and I can't even know, remember his name is Dr. Wayne, I'm saying doctor, I don't know, but uh, Wayne Dwyer, or Wayne Dwyer, I'm not sure, okay. I haven't watched too much of Mr. Dwyer, Dwyer, but um, apparently he was very sick at one point, but couldn't go and see the Jean de but had a friend or an intermediary or something who um, went to this man in Brazil and on behalf of um, Wayne Dwyer, Dwyer, and said, you know, could you do it from long distance? And um, so apparently he gave him a, a drink to take back and, and um, brought it back and, and the man you know, drank it and, and, and of course was, was well um, again. And she said, um, you know, if it were me, if it was someone I knew that was really sick, I would, or if I was sick, I would, that is right where I would go. And um, she said, I, you know, I hope to go, and even if I'm not sick, I hope to go and meet this man, because he's, you know. Um, so I was, you know, <laughs> I was, Polite, and I was like, you know, thank you very much for your concern. I appreciate it. You know, I'll look it up and all of this. Um, and I don't know um, what there is or isn't to the stories of this man. So um, I, I refrained from from passive judgment or going there um, at this time. But um, it, what really struck me about it was how how the the um, the effort of of that conversation, the goal of that conversation, was to say, here's the problem. Here's how you're going to fix it. And to make it very sort of clear cut, black and white, um, that clearly your husband is sick, so go to Brazil to the cave with the crystals and he'll be better. And while as Christians, I think we, we do, or at least I do, I do, I do believe that miracles can happen, I do believe that Jesus performed miracles that are in the Bible and so on. Um, I think it, it's, it's, it's pretty special and, and pretty fair. Um, and I don't think necessarily you have to go to a cave in Brazil with crystals for it to happen. So, um, what, what I'm left with is saying that my life is not like that. My life is, is, is much messier than that. My life is take all the crafts of life and chuck them on the table and something beautiful will come out of it. But, um, but don't, try to, don't try to keep everything in its own basket. Don't try to keep all the pom pops together and all the, all the foamy pieces together because it's just not going to work. Um, uh, so how does that fit in with God? Last week in Sunday school, um, I was scrambling for a, for a plan, and uh, in the end what I did with them was this. I had them each take a paper, and they, they had to find a corner that was private where nobody could see them, and take three crayons with them. And then I gave them a series of instructions. I said, everybody draw two circles. And it was open. You could draw the circles any way you wanted to um, draw them. We're going to have another time. Um, but I draw the circles any way that you want to draw them. And then I did, um, you know, draw five lines. They could cross or not cross. And then, and then I forget what some of the other uh, shapes and triangles or whatever. Um, and then my last thing was, now pick one object in your picture. And however this makes sense to you, make that object look like it's shining. So yeah, they did what they did. And then we came back and we compared all of our pictures. So of course you can see where this is going, yes? So all of them have the same instructions, and all of them have the same elements in their picture, but of course every picture looked very, very, very different. And so my point to the kids was, 
that God gives us, um, he gives us rules, he gives us um, guidelines, he gives us um, suggestions, he gives us examples, he gives us stories, he gives us all kinds of things. And then our job is to take all of that and interpret it in our own lives as best as we can. And that's sort of the crux of it. It's as best as we can. Um, I'm, I'm doing a paper right now on um, using singing as a tool for a second language um, acquisition. And there are probably 500,000 articles that I have to choose from to use, and probably 50,000 books that I could use as references. Um, but of course, it's entirely impractical to do a review of all those articles. And so the task for me is to take you know, 10 or 12 of, of the ones that I think represent best or that I can connect with, and to use them and, and to write something. And it won't be a full picture. It won't be comprehensive. But that little piece will be just a little bit clearer. Um, and so I think that's kind of what we have to do every day with this whole question of things are not black and white. Things are coming at us all at once. We have a million choices to make all the time. And it's, not, it's often not clear what the best way to go is. Um, but we have to live just the same. Um, so how does that? How do we apply that in our life? I can't. I'm trying to cut things out, and if I don't, if I cut things out, the logic of it won't progress. Um, um, so I'll just very quickly take you through my next link, okay? So that we can go to the next place, which is um, another teacher. So I've been working a lot. Some of my teachers are all story teacher uh, teacher stories. My stories are teacher stories. Um, that I thought about as I said, well, how do we do this? You know, what are some examples of how how to sort of take it all in and then kind of make your best guess or make your best choices based on all the messiness? Um, um, this, there's another teacher that I'm quite good friends with, and she does it brilliantly in the classroom. She she has this way um, of being able to let go of the behaviors or the you know the little this and that that go on in the, in the classroom that she knows through experience and, and so on aren't crucial. You know, if, if so-and-so doesn't want to sit in the circle, they can sit in the corner and read their book. Or, you know, um, different, just different things like that. It's even hard to put a finger on specifically. But she also knows when a behavior happens that she needs to, to, to call them on and to pull them up short. And, and she does that balance amazingly well. And I can see that that's, that's the goal. And I can see that how well she does it, but I still don't have a full um, handle on it. But to me, it's, it's, it's that ability is what, what we need to um, develop as Christians trying to live in this world of a million things. Um, and it has to have something to do with keeping your eye on the prize and knowing your goal, knowing where you're trying to get to, and operating, but operating out of a rootedness that is strong and deep. Let's skip the song, okay? We were going to sing All I Once Held Dear. Is it okay if we skip the song? We'll skip the song, All I Once Held Dear. So instead of singing All I Once Held Dear, which of course is all about all the things you thought were important, and you let them go and you realize that God is really the one who's the most important, maybe we'll sing it later instead. Um, then we're going to do, uh, Richard is going to make a link to the gospel. So now it's going to be your turn. Okay? You have to read the, whole, the gospel first? Go for it. You should. Actually, it's a very long gospel. Again, so uh, it, it so the gospel is from John uh, today, and it is one. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you're going there again. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, you will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. 
Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep, but the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could, he, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you, all, I knew, I knew that you always hear me. But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of Christ. So, so when I, I read the readings this morning to do this this small bit, and I was struck by by two things. Um, the first was uh, really in the Lazarus story. It was just like typical confusion in a big family thing. He's dead. No, he's not. He's asleep. No, he's only ill. It's okay. Are oh, we going? No, we're not going. It's really dangerous there. We should be going there. And out of all this confusion, which sounds just like packing up for vacation or. Um, or, um, or, or many, or family weddings, or anything that's, that's that's going on. Out of this, in the middle of all this confusion, Jesus suddenly says, "I am the resurrection and the life," and suddenly takes charge of the whole thing. And and the, the net result is that Lazarus Lazarus comes out. So that was that was that was one bit that really really struck me about. Um, you know, some things in the Bible are very clear cut, but this is definitely not one. Of them. And then the other part was all three readings this morning all talk about how um, how the spirit of God has to be in you. The, the first one, the God blows on the bones and they become real people. Without without His breath, it, it's, there is no real life there. It's just just bones and sinews and, and bodies. And then one from Romans um, about how the spirit of Christ needs to be in us. And then this one again. It's not till Jesus arrives, even though He, he could have done it. Um, otherwise, but and he was fairly laid back about the whole thing. It's always the impression I get as well. But when he arrives and he's actually there, and um, he's actually moved by the faith of the, the people around him, that he breathes new life into Lazarus. And uh, and it has always 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 struck me actually that I don't suppose Lazarus was the same man after that either. And I was it, the Bible was very quiet on this, but I'd be quite curious to know how Martha and Mary and. Lazarus all interacted after it because it's it's not like just been away for the weekend. He's been in the grave four days and now he's back uh, and he's been raised from the dead. It, yeah, how that and, and so how it plays out after somebody has been transformed is is also an interesting question. So that that was one side that I found, um, or, or the, the two things that I found really interesting about the readings. One was the, um, the the just the confusion, and the other was. Um, was that the Spirit of God has to be there. And that... Um, Can I just go a picture? 
Yeah. 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 So, and that, that, I think last time we spoke about Ecclesiastes, and there's another bit of Ecclesiastes that falls into another new approach, which I think says a lot about the, the ambiguity and the, uh, the fact that mourning and dancing, as the quote puts it, happens simultaneously in everyone's lives. It's not, it, it's not like we get through all the hard stuff and then suddenly we get to this um, fantastic place on earth where nothing is wrong. Maybe that will be the case in heaven, but not on earth. Um, but it, it, it is always, there's always a balance. So the, the, the quote for that is, there is a time for mourning, a time for dancing, but mourning and dancing are never fully separated. Their times do not necessarily follow each other. In fact, their times may become one time. Morning may turn into dancing, and dancing into morning without showing a clear point to where one ends and the other starts. Often our grief allows us to carry back our dance, but our dance creates the, spe creates the space for our grief. We lose a beloved friend, and in the midst of our tears we discover an unknown joy. We celebrate success, and in the midst of the party we feel deep sadness. Morning and dancing, grief and laughter, sadness and gladness, they belong together as the sad face clan and the happy face clan, who, both, who make us both laugh and cry. So let's trust that the beauty of our lives become visible where morning and dancing touch each other. So practically speaking, where does that lead us? I like to get down to brass tacks, so what do we do with all of that? Um, uh, and it was new into the rescue again um, with, with another really um, interesting idea. How do we make it work in our everyday life? We desire God, but there's so much going on, so much ambiguity, so much confusion, so many choices, things pulling us in so many directions. So how do we kind of organize that? Um, so, so, so here's a thought. Desire is often talked about as something we ought to overcome. Still, being is desiring. Our bodies, our minds, our hearts, and our souls are full of desires. Some are unruly, turbulent, and very distracting. Some make us think deep thoughts and see great visions. Some teach us how to love. And some keep us searching for God. Our desire for God is the desire that should guide all the other desires. Otherwise, our bodies, minds, hearts, and souls become one another's enemies and our inner lives become chaotic, leading us to despair and self-destruction. Spiritual desires are not ways to eradicate all our desires, but ways to order them, getting organized, so that they can serve one another and together serve God. So what are one's dominant desires in those four categories? And when I read it, it, it really hit me, and, and it was like within one minute that I could answer that. What is the desire of your body? What is the desire of your mind? What is the desire of your heart? And what is the desire of your soul? Um, for you, there's not, obviously there's not one answer. It's, it's wherever you are at right now. So where, what is the desire of your body, the desire of your mind, the desire of your heart, and the desire of your soul? And I was toying with, do I give you my answers where I was at with that, or do I let you think about it and leave you hanging and you can ask me if you want to know what my answers were? I think I, think I should leave it with you. I think you should try to answer that. Usually I try to do an interactive moment, but it might be too personal, so I won't ask you to tell me what your answers are. Um, but I think it's worth thinking about, because it's, if, if, if we have that clear in our brains, what all those desires of all those, those sort of four main categories are, and, and to understand how they can come together with a, sp a spiritual desire at the head, I think that can help us clear some of the ambiguity, or if not clear it, at least allow us to embrace it, to know that it, to know that that it's okay that there are all these different elements and that they can still work together. Does that make sense? Yeah. We we're gonna have prayers now. Can we have prayers? You might be invaded, but yes. We can have prayers. Gail said it was time to commit. Gail said it was time to commit. Of course, Gail. I was time to give. <laughs> um, okay, so Richard um, planned some prayers that went along with these four categories, these four desires. Um, so I invite you to continue to think about that for yourself, and we're just going to lead us in prayers, and we'll have a song kind of behind, and we'll finish with uh, singing the song together afterwards. Let's pray. Stop by praying for, for our bodies. For physical health, our physical health, and the physical health of those we know who are suffering. For our physical needs, for food, for our daily bread. And for guidance as to where we spend our time to use our talents.
pray that you'll with our minds too. Pray for the gift of being able to discern right from wrong in a very ambiguous world. Pray for those with, with mental health problems, and those we know who are suffering. strength to focus our minds to understand you and your world. We pray that your spirit might have a home in our hearts. We pray that your love will be so with our hearts that we will unknowingly share your love with those we know. Both our friends and maybe those we don't like quite as much. We pray for our souls. That who we are will be more like you every day. We pray for forgiveness for those things we've done wrong. Spirit will breathe new life into everything that we do and everything that we